I'm here again with Doug Haynes, the president of Point72. You've got a really good reputation on the street. Everybody wants to work here. Talk a little bit about Point72 Academy. So the idea for the Academy had been around before I arrived, but had never really gotten traction. And uh, my view uh, was and has been that having a really strong talent development capability within uh, a professional firm is vital. Um, professional people tend to be extremely motivated by the opportunity to learn and grow and get better at what they do and you know sharpen their thinking. Um, and there was no reason we couldn't extend that back to undergrads. Uh, we were also troubled that we were very dependent on a hand for hiring analysts, uh, equity analysts, we're very dependent on a handful of sources. And that dependence is worrisome. You might aspire to a different mix of talent, but you can't get it, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you, in fact, you get what they hire, which, you know, candidly tends to be a little more homogeneous. Um, and that's the next part is that homogeneity is a problem. There's a profile, and I don't know where it comes from, right? Whether it's, I don't know which is the chicken or the egg, but there's a profile that comes into the financial services industry that is, you know, to be candid, white male, economics or finance degree from a northeastern school, right? You know, there's sure. a certain very specific profile. Nothing wrong with that profile unless it's everybody in your firm. Because if it's everybody in your firm and everybody sees things the same way, you start to create a lot of risk because all the thinking gets correlated. And when there's a problem, you, know, you don't have the diversification of ideas and perspectives that makes you aware of it. Um, and we all saw that, and but we all kind of came back to it's because the feedstock is we're dependent on somebody else, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody else's choices. So the real power of the academy was to create our own choices. And uh, we did not anticipate that we would necessarily be able to provide the early equity analysis development and training better than we had been getting from other sources of hiring experienced people, but that's turned out to be the case. The way we view it, we really do have the best of all worlds. We've got a combination of real diversity of backgrounds, real diversity of experiences and perspectives, very high performance, um, a lot of interest from a lot of sources that never wind up in the financial services industry. Uh, we think we have something exciting to offer that is going to attract young people into the financial services industry who weren't even thinking about coming to it. Uh, and the numbers seem to bear it out. Uh, this year we, for the academy, full-time academy positions, we had uh, well over 5,000 applications. Wow. Uh, from everywhere, all okay. around the world. And how many people did you end up bringing on board? I think we're going to end up at about 15. Okay. So it's pretty selective. What makes that individual? I mean, 15 out of 5,000, what is that little, yeah, nuance? Boy, I wish I, I wish I, there's no formulaic answer, to be honest. We go through a bunch of screens around all the stuff you would expect, right? Demonstrated achievement, demonstrated excellence. Um, we do look for a diversity in field of study. Right? We don't want to hire all finance backgrounds, nor do we want to hire necessarily all hard science backgrounds. We want to, we want to blend uh, a field of study. Um, we like people who have demonstrated grit, uh, what we think of as demonstrated grit. So an example is somebody who's financed their own education, somebody who's um, uh, had uh, uh, you know, a roll-up-your-sleeves job of one kind or another. Uh, we like to see that. Uh, we like to see people who have a demonstrated interest in the markets. They don't have to have expertise, but some level of interest, right? Um, because these slots are precious, and we don't want to you know, have people come and join the academy who aren't really interested in it. Um, but the interest could express itself in a bunch of different ways, right? Being a member of the investing club. Uh, it could be managing a personal portfolio. Uh, it could be <coughs> investing the family's money. Uh, or you know, being part of that. Uh, it's not a requirement, but we like to see it. Um, and uh, we, we frankly, uh, we are looking for some specialized slots as well because we're using the academy. We've got offices around the world and we're using the academy now to feed analytic talent into offices in other parts of the world. So it's interesting to hire somebody who wants to work in Asia or somebody who might want to work in Europe. We just had the election. <laughs> Donald Trump is the new president. Uh, President-elect. President-elect, exactly. Very good point. Uh, what 
would you like to see done in terms of regulation in the finance industry? First and foremost, I should clarify, I'm not an expert on regulation in the industry. I do think, however, that uh, I'm going to speak more broadly about the finance industry. Um, I do think, however, that uh, we need to encourage investment in the U.S. We need to, um, investment always carries risk, uh, and we have to, you have to safeguard against systematic risk, but you can't be allergic to risk in general, right? The, you know, it is a simple fact that growth, you know, growth requires investment and investment always bears risk. You know, we're all, we're all living looking at an unpredictable future. Nobody can see that our, the election itself shows nobody can really accurately predict how the future is going to unfold. Uh, and that means that risk is part of it. Um, now that doesn't affect us as much as, you know, as, as uh, it does you know, our, the banks and some of our banking partners. Um, but I do think that um, there has been a tone in regulation around risk avoidance that is unhelpful, uh, unhelpful to the growth of the country. I, one other thing, I, it, there is an adversarial tone between the regulators and the businesses that we don't believe in. Mm -hmm. We've had um, a government assigned uh, uh, third party evaluator uh, looking at our compliance practices and procedures. Uh, we have an on-site monitor assigned to us by the SEC right now. Um, our doors are open to these folks. Uh, we're very keen to show them everything we're doing. Um, we are keen for them to give us their observations. We are open to their ideas on how we can do it better. Um, we show, we, the only instruction I ever give when we have regulators on site is give them any access they want and just tell them the truth. Whatever question they ask, tell them the truth. Uh, don't stardust anything, uh, because we can't learn if we don't. And we don't believe that there should be a hostile relationship between businesses and the regulators who have a charge to keep the industry safe or to keep the public safe. We, don't, we just don't view it as hostile. Uh, and there is a hostile tone. It's romanticized in the media, right? The, 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 the notion that there has to be this hostility and trying to add drama to that. We just don't buy it. We don't believe in it. We, we think it should be a constructive relationship. We, at the end of the day, are aiming for the same thing, a healthy industry that adds to the economy, that adds to society. We want the same thing. It doesn't need to be hostile. Lastly, you're talking to the graduating class of 2017. <laughs> uh, after all of the stuff that's gone on uh, recently in the world, what sort of advice would you give young people today? I'm going to give advice that may be a little bit controversial, but uh, I believe that it's important to be honest. It's the same advice I give my kids. Uh, I think that the advice that has been given to young people over the last few years is not constructive from my view. And the advice, the, this is the advice of, you know, you should follow your passion. I don't think that that's necessarily wrong, but I do think that you have to recognize the context of where you are. The most important thing that a young person can do is set themselves up to learn. I think it's crucial to make early career decisions based on the opportunity to learn and grow professionally. Um, should that align with your passions? Yes. But is your passion, should you put your passion at the top? I don't think so. I think your first priority should be, you should recognize that you're in a development phase of your life and that you should make your decisions based on maximizing that development. You'll learn what your passions really are. Right? A young person graduating from college may think they, want, they know what they want to do for the rest of their lives. I can guarantee it's not true. Right? It may be the odd exception. So I strongly think you make, you, you make your first decision based on your opportunities to grow personally and professionally. Uh, and then have an open mind. Right? Have an open mind about where it's headed. Um, I'll offer one other thought that's going to sound cynical, but um, I think so many young people look around and view that the measure of success is, you know, to become an internet billionaire, right? To, to go off and, you know, invent this thing and, and have a private jet. Uh, and I strongly believe that there are much more rich measures of success, much more interesting ways. Uh, mu the, the world has a lot more to offer than that. Uh, and I think people should be open-minded about how they define their success as well. Well, Doug, this has been a really refreshing uh, interview. Cannot thank you enough. 
Uh, again, I'm here with Doug Haynes, who is the president of Point72. Really, really appreciate your time and wish you continued success. Thank you, Steve.